Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle from Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. This is an audio version of a book review that I have written. The book under review is by John Keith Davies and was titled The Local Church, A Living Body. It was published by Evangelical Press in 2001 and it is 271 pages in length. My written review first appeared in the Evangelical Forum Newsletter, Volume 2, Number 1, in 2004, and it appeared on pages 11 and 12. Here now is the review. John Keith Davies served as a Baptist pastor in Wales for over 37 years and helped to plant four independent congregations. This book was his final literary work, completed just before his death in 1999, then collected and edited by his children for publication. It is a manual or handbook on body life and church order, covering a variety of practical topics on the nature of authentic biblical community. The local church is divided into four parts. Part one is titled, The Local Church and Its Life, from pages 15 to 101. First, a biblical case is made for the New Testament understanding of a regenerate church membership where meaningful participation of each body part is the norm. Davies then discusses the local church and its relationship with other local churches. He stresses the Baptist doctrine of local church autonomy, but also stresses the importance of cooperation among churches. Doctrinal agreement is paramount for real cooperation. Quote, where truth is denied, there can be no fellowship at all. Any organization or so-called church that denies the truth is to be avoided or withdrawn from. Doctrines necessary for salvation and for local church life are fundamental to fellowship between churches. Any relationship with another church has to be approached carefully, and the basis for the relationship must be clear from the outset. It makes no sense at all for churches that believe the scripture to be their final authority in all matters of faith and practice to belong to an organization that does not. Similarly, it makes no sense for such a church to belong to an organization where error is accepted as valid and is thereby approved, In quote, page 68. Finally, in this first section, Davies also examines the local church's relationship with the state. Davies writes as a citizen of a nation that has a state church, Anglicanism. He argues that, quote, the state and the church are separate with different functions in different spheres, end quote, page 96. Therefore, he says that it is not appropriate for the state, quote, to pay people as employees to teach religion, end quote, or for religion to be a part of state school curriculum, see page 96. In addition, he argues that it is wrong for the state, quote, to employ men to preach and teach Christianity to military personnel and prison inmates, end quote, page 97, or for the church to accept public funds for their work because, quote, state financial aid can lead to a loss of freedom of action and can eventually lead to state control, end quote, page 97. Part two is the local church and its membership from pages 102 to 166. The author here covers the topics of baptism and the Lord's Supper. He argues for traditional, strict, baptistic interpretations of these ordinances, not sacraments. Baptism is for believers only and by immersion. The Lord's Supper is limited to baptized believers and is hosted by the local church. Davies rejects open table practices, arguing that the Lord's Supper should not be a semi-public event, but it is best restricted to members of the local church in order to provide proper attention to discipline. One may not fully agree with his close, close communion argument, but one must also admit that the author makes a winsome defense of the practice. Davies also stresses in this chapter the privileges and responsibilities of service in the church by all the members. Finally, he argues for proper harmony and balance in the roles of men and women in the life and ministry of the church, contending for the biblical exercise of male headship. Part three is the local church and its leadership, pages 167 to 201. 
Davies argues for the biblical roles of both elders and deacons. He stresses the role of deacons as servants and not as a board of directors. He also argues for the concept of plural leadership or plural elders in the church, but concurrently contends for the special and singular leadership of the pastor. Davies concludes that a church cannot be run by committee. It needs the leadership of the pastor. He frankly acknowledges that the recent discovery of plural eldership in many Baptist churches in the last 30 years has been a mixed blessing. Quote, although there have been blessings, there have also been problems, largely because the principles of plurality, the principle of plurality was accepted without working out carefully its implications, end quote, page 184. Men should not be placed in the role of elder just to fulfill a desire for plurality. They should be spiritually qualified, and the distinct role of the pastor among the elders should be recognized and respected. Better to have a single elder than place men who are not fit for the eldership in the role, quote, to satisfy some mathematical scruple derived apparently from Scripture, end quote, page 268. Finally, part four is the local church and its mission pages 202 to 271. Here Davies focuses on the church's responsibility to do mission and outreach. He advocates church planting in particular once a church has grown beyond a size where intimate fellowship among its members is no longer viable. Davies also maintains that we should beware of falling into the trap of allowing the end, saving of the lost, to justify any and all means. See page 226. When results control our practice of evangelism, Davies notes, quote, anything which produces results is considered legitimate. Even the slick, high-powered, costly, gaudy, entertainment-centered, gigantic crusade. It is evangelism so long as it produces results. The integrity of the gospel of the grace of God is thereby relegated to the level of secondary significance. End quote, page 226. In the end, he contends for the old method of evangelizing, the foolishness of preaching. This book is striking for its many sound observations that run so counter to the church growth mania of the contemporary evangelical church in America. For example, in his discussion of, of the church's meeting place, Davies observes, quote, The church itself similarly should not be too large for fellowship to be real and meaningful. When a church gets too large for meaningful fellowship, it is time to plant another church, end quote, page 31. Later, Davies offers these further observations on size. Quote, growth is evidence of life, but numerical growth can bring problems. A large church can easily become complacent and often has a high proportion of passengers in its membership, than a relatively small church. This is true even where a large church seems to have lots of so-called converts, while a small church may appear to have few. Small, however, does not necessarily mean beautiful. A small church can be as dead as a large church, but it certainly looks more pathetic. Small numbers do not guarantee effectiveness or spirituality in a church. Yet small companies do have many advantages where there is genuine spiritual life. Small churches can experience a greater sense of fellowship where every member knows and is known. In smaller churches, pastoral work can become a reality. End quote, page 266. He concludes, quote, In order for the church's fellowship and pastoral care to be a practical possibility between 100 and 150 members, is likely the maximum size of membership, end quote, page 270. This book is to be highly recommended to both pastors and laymen. Davies' book comes across as fresh and biblically faithful for believers living in what appears to be an increasingly post-Christian secular culture. The local church would make a great study for church officers to work through during the course of a year of service together. I do not agree with every viewpoint expressed in the book, but it offers a treasure trove of wisdom from a laborer who spent many years of fruitful service in the vineyard and has now been called home. Go to your local secondhand bookshop and sell your copies of The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life 
and use the proceeds to buy this book. Here ends the review. You can receive audio book reviews and book notes like this one, Word Magazine podcasts and sermons by subscribing to Christ Reformed Baptist Church's sermon audio uh, feed on iTunes by searching for Christ Reformed Baptist Church. For video material, you can subscribe to the Word Magazine channel on youtube.com. You can also find written book reviews, book notes, and articles on my blog, jeffriddle.net.